There's my mic unmuting itself. It likes to stop lately. These are the odd things that happen in video broadcasts. My name is Jesse Ever, and a huge welcome into all of you for joining us all across Canada, the U.S., and beyond. If you're new to us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. We do over 40 live, free, interactive broadcasts every single month, and everything we do, including this program, so you can show your friends and family later, goes straight to our YouTube channel, so you can watch this tomorrow. You can watch us three years down the road. You can watch us whenever you want uh, in the future, which is very, very exciting. Now, today is particularly exciting for a number of reasons. Uh, one, we're going to have a Kahoot quiz together, so I'll bring this up on the screen now. We will be doing a four-question interactive fun game between our talk and our Q&A portion. So if you want to pull this up on a separate tab and hold tight, I promise we'll have a little bit of fun between and before the question period. Now, today we are welcoming back don't tell the other people we partner with. My favorite group that we work with of all time. In the last seven years, I think we've done like 50 programs with them that are again, all on that YouTube channel. Everything from sloths to otters to owls and more. So many incredible animals that they have at the Toucan Rescue Ranch. Toucan Rescue Ranch is all about rescuing, rehabilitating, re-releasing injured wildlife in one of the most biodiverse and amazing places on this planet in Costa Rica. Today, we are gonna talk about toucans, literally the the and the, the name behind our Toucan Rescue Ranch today, we don't often talk about toucans. We've got a lot of sloth programs with them. So today we're going to explore some really, really cool birds. We're going to have that fun kahoot together. I'm so excited for you to join us. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the education coordinator at the Toucan Rescue Ranch. Steph, she is going to blow your mind with some of the cool stuff they've got going on there. And so nice to have you today, even if we've got only a bit of the screen together. And uh, take us away, Steph. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. Hi, everyone. As always, it's so excited to be able to share all the wonderful conservation work that we do with you here at the Toucan Rescue Ranch. And as Jesse mentioned, today's focus is going to be birds. So Toucan Rescue Ranch is a rescue center that started off with Leslie, an American, who had the idea of helping out toucans. Why toucans in particular? Well, guys, it turns out that many rescue centers work with animals such as parrots, it was something very common. However, toucans are very popular pets. And she realized as she started volunteering for programs that focused in the rehabilitation and rewilding of macaws, that there weren't any programs in Costa Rica that worked with toucans in particular. So she decided that she was going to help out uh, Toucan. So that is how she opened up Toucan Rescue Ranch in 2004. So now I'm going to go ahead and change the view of my camera, guys, so that you can take a look at uh, a better view of the animals that we help out here at the Toucan Rescue Ranch. So we're going to start off with taking a look at the biggest species of toucan that we have in Costa Rica. So my friend over here's name is Princess. Princess is a chestnut mandible or yellow-throated toucan. And Princess actually comes from another rescue center uh, who brought her over here. And we don't really know her backstory, but what we do know is that it's very likely that Princess here was a pet in and possibly a person's house. And this is actually very common. We have the same situation, not only with Princess, we have the same situation with Tuki over here. Tuki's a juvenile toucan. And he too was kept as a pet and he is very friendly. So you can really tell that he was kept as a pet because instead of flying away, he hops right towards, <laughs> towards us. And that is of course not a natural behavior for a bird. Something that is very interesting that not a lot of people know, when they get an animal like a toucan as a pet, it's that toucans and parrots, not only are they not closely related, but to top it off, they are very different in their habitats in nature, the ecosystem. The role that they play is completely different. An animal such as a parrot is actually a seed predator. So they go out, they eat the fruit and the seeds of different uh, plants. And of course, they're very social birds. Some groups of parrots live in groups of hundreds and they have partners for life. They're very social. Now here's the thing with toucans, guys. Even though toucans do pair up to breed the babies, 
So you'll have mom and dad taking care of babies. They can have, uh, they can lay up to five eggs depending on the species, sometimes a little less. It turns out that toucans are not particularly social. They don't have this need to socialize the way a parrot does. And you will often see solitary toucans out there in the wild. And this means that when they are kept as pets, they might bond with you or they just might not because it's not in their nature to be as social as a parrot. Now there's something else that is very different compared with parrots. And it's what they eat. Toucans are not seed predators. They actually like, yes, eating fruit and they might disperse seeds. But the other thing that toucans do is that they are nest predators, guys. What this means is that they're going to find the nests of other birds and they're going to go ahead and try to eat the eggs, the babies, the hatchlings. And when it's reproductive time, guys, they can get particularly carnivorous. <laughs> what this means is that they are going to go ahead and attack and eat other adult birds. They can eat things such as small rodents, snakes, lizards. I've seen footage of toucans hunting bats. So they're actually predators. And with being a predator comes the fact that you need to be rather aggressive to be able to hunt down other animals. So right here, guys, we have Sudi. Sudi was also kept as a pet. Interesting fact, guys. Ooh, listen. Sudi is no fan of women. <laughs> I have a theory, which I cannot prove, but I really think that whoever owns Sudi was actually very mean to her because whenever a, a female approaches Sudi, Sudi goes crazy aggressive. So that sound you just heard is not her being friendly. Oh, she wants to, <laughs> wow, she really wants to get to me. Uh, it's her really just wanting to bite me. So sometimes people get these animals as pets and they're in for a surprise when they realize that they're not the social bird that they expected. And very often they bring it to the rescue center, sometimes lying to us and telling us, yeah, we found this bird on the ground and we're just helping it out. But we know because of their behaviors, sometimes because of uh, physical traits, once we had a toucan who had this sort of wedge on the bill. And this wedge is usually done when baby toucans are kept in cages for long periods of time. When a baby bird is born, the bill is not as hard as the bill of an adult. And what, what this means, guys, is that if there is constant friction with something as hard as metal, then, of course, the bill can deform. So we've had cases of uh, yellow-throated toucans who have this peculiarity. Um, and sadly, once they come to the rescue center, too habituated, too used to humans, and also imprinted. So when I say an animal is imprinted, it means that the human has left an, an, uh, an impression in the bird that cannot be erased. And the toucans then associate humans with food. And instead of flying off when a toucan approaches, when a human approaches, they're actually going to go ahead and uh, get close to the person asking for food. So any bird that has been too long in captivity is not a candidate for release. However, guys, we rehabilitate and rewild as many toucans as we possibly can. Now, I'd love to talk about some other interesting toucan facts. Since Sudi is being so helpful, showing off all the cool parts of her body. Uh, now, guys, some cool facts about birds are, of course, the colors. Uh, you'll see that they have all these really nice, bright colors. Uh, in Costa Rica, we have six different species, but in the world, there's over 30 different species, all of them found in the American continent. It's called the Rumphastid family. And all Rumphastids have uh, this really long bill. It's one of the things that uh, characterizes them and also the color. When these birds are kept as pets, very often people don't realize that these are predators that these animals need to eat some form of protein. Here we give them eggs several times a day. However, if they're only fed fruit, what is going to happen is that these beautiful bright colors that you see in Suri, they're gonna wash away 
And sadly, sometimes they come as if someone had cast an eraser on the bird. Those, look, those colors look really washed. So a sign of good health is seeing these nice, bright colors. And something that is very peculiar is that we have some species that are very similar, except for the color of the bill. And very soon, I'm going to show you some examples of some other species. Now, let's talk a little about the bill a little bit more. Uh, the thing with the bill is that it's made out of keratin. So keratin is the same material that we have in our hair and our nails. So it's resistant, yet light at the same time. Now, toucans are weighed down by this huge bill. And you'll notice that Sudi actually hops around the enclosure quite a bit. That is a common way for toucans to move around. Uh, they don't tend to do these really long flights the way, for example, a raptor might, you know? They soar up high in the air, traveling from one area to another. They tend to do short uh, movements from patch of trees to patch of trees, and once they're in the tree, they do what Sudi's doing. They hop around the enclosure a lot. Now, another cool thing about the bill is that the bill is like a radiator. It is a tool that they have to be able to cool down when it's very hot. And believe me, right now in Central America, we're going through a heat wave. It can be really, really, really hot, guys. So it's very handy for a tropical bird to have ways to cool down. And it turns out that inside the bill of a toucan, there's a whole network of blood vessels, of veins. Um, and that doesn't happen with all, uh, many species of birds. So inside this bill, uh, you will find a whole network of veins. When the toucan is very hot, they're gonna go ahead and pump a lot of blood to the bill, and they're going to open up the bill in a fresh breeze to be able to lower their body temperature. So this bill can be very handy. It can help out to get food, of course. It can be a tool for protection, but also it can be a sort of radiator that helps them cool down when it's getting really, really hot. Another cool thing, since Sudi is opening up her bill, let's see if she does it again, is their tongue. Their tongue is actually a sort of, let's say like a sort of feather. It looks like a feather. And the way that they swallow food is not the same way that other birds do. For example, parrots have a very human-like tongue. Um, these guys actually grab the fruit, and then they gr uh, throw it towards the back of the throat to be able to swallow. And baby birds need help from their parents to be able to swallow the food because it takes a, uh, a moment to master this huge bill. Now, I was telling you that the bill of toucans play several roles. One of the cool roles it plays is something called interspecific differentiation. What is this? It means that some species that are very similar can use this big bill, uh, which helps them draw attention to partners, but also will help species that look very similar tell each other apart from a distance. So right here, guys, we have an arasari. This is a fiery bill, the arasari. Why fiery bill? Because it, it, the bill looks like a little flame. It is bright orange to red on the tip. It transitions to yellow and it's green at the base of the bill. Now, <laughs> my friend Scooby here was also kept as a pet. And again, being a pet is not equivalent to being friendly with humans. He actually is not a fan of people. <laughs> and as you can see, if I approach my camera too much, he's gonna try to bite. So again, another case of someone who thought, oh, beautiful bird, I would love to have it as a pet. And they were in for a surprise when they realized just how aggressive Scooby was. Now, I am explaining this thing about the bill being handy for interspecific differentiation, because in the case of these toucans, there's actually two very similar species. That was a fiery bill, or a sorry. But over here, guys, we have some colored arasaris. So colored arasaris are birds that live in groups. Um, these birds uh, are more common in the Caribbean than they are in the Pacific, which is the case of the fiery bill arasari. However, part of the interesting fact about these birds is that even though they're very, very similar uh, to the fiery bill arasaris, 
their bill is drastically different. The colors are pretty much just black, yellow, and sort of brown. And this helps in the places where the two species of toucans can find each other. This way they can easily tell each other apart. So Parker might be a little bit more useful <laughs> for this explanation. So here you can see Parker a little better than the other toucans I know is a little bit dark. Well guys, it turns out that oh, he's coming closer. Fiery billed arasaris and colored arasaris, color wise are pretty much the same. So they're, they have yellow uh, on the front with a black uh, sort of hole in the chest, red line in the belly with black, uh, mainly black with a red rump. But then you'll see the drastic difference between the color of the bell. This also happens with uh, the first species I showed you. And I'm going to show you how similar it is to toucans like Suri. Um, but just another interesting fact about Arasaris. So I was telling you that most toucans are not social, right? They live in groups, they help breed the babies, but then they take off when the babies have fledged, meaning that they have left the nest. They can be solitary. That is true to many species of toucans, but not to Arasaris. Arasaris live in groups. And in the other enclosures, uh, it was a little bit dark, maybe you didn't see, but uh, with Scooby, with the fire bill, Rosari lives am uh, is Amber, who had a lesion in her wing and couldn't be rewilded. They were brought up together and they became a little group. Next to my friend Parker here are three Rosaris, Delta, Echo, and Gobbles. They came to the Toucan Rescue Ranch when somebody cut down the tree where they were living. Uh, and they were brought here very young and they were bred together even though they're not really siblings. Now, poor Parker over here, sadly, he was a similar story, except that he came this year. He's actually a very young toucan. Uh, we had two colored arasaris that survived when the tree was cut down, Peter and Parker. Peter and Parker were bred together. They were brought up the exact same way. Now, what happened? It turns out that the personality of Peter was being aggressive, was not being very social. He was afraid of humans. Now, what happened to my friend Parker? Parker is the exact opposite. Parker is social. Parker is sort of uh, curious, as you can see. And sadly, this is the kind of behavior that we don't want in a bird that is going to be rewilded. We were able to rewild Parker. I'm sorry, Peter, but not Parker. And you might think, hey, why don't you put it in with the rest of the collared Arasaris? Because we have a little group of three Arasaris in this enclosure. Now, sadly, that is something that we cannot do, guys, because something very common in Arasaris is that they work as a group to kill other birds. And part of this means that they can kill other birds the same species. They can actually be cannibals and eat birds that are not in their same social group just because they felt that they were hungry and the other RSR was in the wrong, in the wrong place at the wrong time. So a very interesting fact that you probably didn't know about toucans, they can be cannibals. Who knew? <laughs> now... I'd like to show you the fourth species that we have at the Toucan Rescue Ranch. Uh, this is my friend Totem. Totem is having a little snack, but I'm sure he's going to get close in a moment. This is one of the most popular species to be kept as a pet. Uh, this is called the Kill Bill Toucan or the Rainbow Bill Toucan. Why Rainbow Bill? Because he has all the colors of the rainbow. Well, not all of them, but many colors of the rainbow on the bill. Uh, red, orange, blue, green. So this is a very appealing bird for a lot of people. Uh, if you see that Totem is doing something, he's actually washing his bill right now. So he gets inside the water, he takes a little shower, and then he uses the branches to clean his bill so it looks nice and bright and clean. So he's taking a little shower right now. Now, Totem is a very special case. Oh, and before I get to Totem's story, you will see that this species of toucan is very similar to yellow-throated toucan. Now, what is a big difference? A big difference, again, is the color of the bill. So 
the feathers is pretty much the same color. Um, they both have a yellow throat. They both have green around the eyes, uh, a white rump and red vent, blue feet, but then the bill, the color of the bill is that very different special thing that these guys uh, have that differentiate them. And these two species have a big range overlap. So they are bound to meet each other constantly. So it's important to have something that tells them apart drastically so that they they don't get confused when they're mating. Now the yellow throated toucan is the biggest species. There is a difference in size, but besides that, the drastical difference is the color of the bill. Uh, now let's see if Totem, hey Totem, wanna come say hi, sweetie? We've had such luck so far, Steph. It's been amazing having birds come right up to the fence with you. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If he doesn't want to come, don't worry. We have loads of other birds we uh, that I would love to show you. Now, Totem is usually very, very friendly, but I, he is busy with his shower right now. <laughs> uh, but I do want to share with you his story. Totem is a bird who came after he crashed against a tree. Now, it's very odd because toucans don't usually crash against trees. Uh, so we have a theory. We believe that it's very likely that Totem was kept as a pet. And either he escaped or he just flew away. But the fact is that um, his behavior is not the behavior of a wild toucan. So sadly, we were not able to rewild him. Uh, and he is a permanent resident. Uh, now, uh, Jesse, do we, I have time to go over to Macaws before we do our break? We can go to Macaws, absolutely. I want to see Macaws, so I think our kids are in the same boat. And then, I will note, as you're heading there, if you guys want to get in our Kahoot, we've already got over 50 of you there, which is very exciting. And if you've got Toucan or Macaw questions or anything about the Toucan Rescue Ranch, we're going to head to Miss Williams' class first, and then one by one through all our live classes. Everyone's here today. It's like a super awesome audience. So thank you all so much for being so as fascinated as I am with all this. Uh, but Steph, yes, you're getting close, it looks like. This is very exciting. Yes. Okay, so over here we are at the macaw enclosure. Of course, macaws are big, big birds. So they have a lot of space. However, a lot of these macaws were kept as pets. So it's very likely that they might feel curious and try to get close to us. Steph, we lost you for a sec. Oh, we lost Steph entirely. She went under and the macaws must have gone for her phone. She'll be back in in a second, folks. Um, it doesn't happen very often in the Toucan Rescue Ranch. They've got great internet there. Uh, but yes, we've had some questions in the chat already. If you guys are keen on questions, we're gonna have a really long Q&A today. So lots of opportunity to hear about and ask uh, Steph anything you might wanna know. She just popped back in and see, I told you she'd be back in. <laughs> sorry, <Bye>. guys, sorry. <laughs> I am back with you. Okay, I was going to start talking a little bit about our macaws. Uh, and they're pretty high up, but these are curious lads. So let's see if they're going to get closer in a moment. So now I would love to talk about the macaw family or the cetacid family. So I already shared a little bit of information about parrots in general. Uh, I was telling you guys that parrots are social birds, that they can live in really big groups. And it so happens that uh, the great green macaw, which is the one that uh, you're seeing right now, is no exception. These birds are the biggest species of ara. Uh, so what we call macaws are in the ara genus. And these guys live in uh, big groups. And like other parrots, they have a partner for life. Now, we have two species of macaws. We have the great green macaw, and we also have the scarlet macaw. Now, here is the thing with uh, great green macaws. These birds are in critical danger of extinction. This means, guys, that if we don't do something drastic to protect their habitats, to uh, really make sure that they don't start losing their homes and being exported as pets, then these birds are going to disappear altogether. So 
Why is it that the Great Green Moth is in danger of extinction? Well, on, the, on one hand, one of the reasons why this is the case, uh, there's the destruction of their habitat. These guys are from the Caribbean lowlands. And sadly, in all of Central America and a part of South America, the Caribbean lowlands got flooded with banana plantations and pineapple plantations. So a big part of their habitat disappeared. But these birds are highly specific uh, in terms of where they make their nests. They like making their nests in just one kind of tree, which is called the mountain almond tree, Dipterix panamensis. And it turns out that that kind of tree has a very, very fine wood uh, that people like using in luxury construction. So because the trees were cut down, then these birds lost their main home where they make their nests. And sadly, because also they are exported uh, in the illegal pet trade market, they're sold as pets too because of their beautiful colors and social nature. Well, sadly, because of these reasons, these birds are, got to a point in Costa Rica where there were no more than 300 individuals left. So 300 individuals is nothing, guys. It's not enough for a species to survive. So every single effort that can be done is being done by organizations that try or are trying to make sure that the great green macaw is able to survive. Now, some census, recent census are indicating that there may be now around 500 individuals left, roughly. It's an estimation. Now, we do have another species of macaw, which I would like to show you, which is the scarlet macaw. So, scarlet macaws are not in the same situation as a great green macaw. Why is that? Because these birds are generalists which means that they make their nests in a big amount of trees and a wide variety of different trees. And another thing that is drastically different is that they have a wider distribution. Great green macaws pretty much only live in the Caribbean lowlands, whereas the scarlet macaw can live in actually quite a wide uh quite a big diversity of different habitats in the Pacific and in the Caribbean. Some scarlet macaws are even known to live in mangroves, which is very peculiar. And that characteristic in Costa Rica actually saved big populations of scarlet macaw from deforestation and from poaching for illegal pet trade. Now, I love scarlet macaws. These are absolutely beautiful birds. <laughs> yeah, they are beautiful birds. You'll see that they have red and yellow and blue. And even though this might seem very flashy, believe it or not, guys, this is actually camouflage. Because one of the favorite, favorite fruits that scarlet macaws like eating are the, are the seeds of the mountain almond tree. I'm sorry, a beach, uh, beach almond tree. Not the, the mountain one is for the great green macaw. Now, the mountain almond tree is a kind of tree that always has red and always has yellow on the leaves. We're in the tropics, so we don't have autumn. We don't have all the leaves falling off in the same time from the trees. You have those beautiful colors in autumn. Here in the tropics, we don't have that trees are always losing their leaves. And in some species of trees, it means that some become very yellow and very red. So in their natural habitat, sometimes you will see groups of, I don't know, 60 scarlet macaws in a huge beech almond tree. And you can barely tell where they are because this is actually great camouflage in the beech almond tree. And another curious thing about, of course, actually all macaws, is that they have crazy strong bills. Uh, some species of macaws can use a force of, of up to 500 pounds when they're cracking up the seeds of the different plants that they eat. So you know what, guys? As I'm a lot more, you know, cautious of a macaw than of a toucan. <laughs> That is some very strong bills uh, they've got. <laughs> Steph, uh, do you mind if we dive in with cahoots and questions? I want to make sure you have an extra long one today. We've had a chance to explore a lot of animals together. Is that a good or is there anything else you wanted to show us before we dive in? No, go right ahead. 
Perfect. Well, in that case, we're going to hang out with our Macaw friends together here, folks. There are already over 80 of you in our Kahoot, which is amazing. If you don't want to play along live, that's totally fine. You can just answer these questions in your class. And we're going to explore a little bit just generally about the amazing work that the Toucan Rescue Branch does. The faster you answer, the more points you get. And what you win from this is Stephanie's everlasting respect. So that is like, it's not a tangible prize, but it is pretty awesome. Uh, so we're going to dive with this four questions, and then we have so many classes live. Uh, we're going to go a little long in Q&A today. So any questions you have about toucans, macaws, anything else, we look very forward to hearing them. Uh, Miss Williams, I'm coming to you guys first when we get started. I'm going to begin our Kahoot so we have extra long time together. Let's dive in and do this thing, everybody. Welcome into our YouTube friends as well. We've got Miss Stevens class, Miss Smith. We've got all sorts of great groups joining us there as well. All right, here we go. The Toucan Rescue Ranch is in what super biodiverse country? We talked about this at the beginning and in between. Panama, Colombia, Costa Rica, or Brazil? What do we think? Steph, are, you're not in Brazil, are you? No, I don't think so. No. Oh, it's nice, too. I, I hope everyone gets a chance to go to there as well as your country. <laughs> yeah, it is. answers in so far? This country has a very special conservation story, and most of you got this right. It is Costa Rica in that they are one of the only countries in the world that really sought to bring back the wild in a really serious way, and they've done better than almost any country on Earth in doing so. So I encourage you to check out Costa Rica's conservation story as well. Question two. It's illegal to have wild animals as pets in Costa Rica. Now, we've talked about some people having wildlife as pets. We've seen that that can make them a little bit aggressive. Is this something that you're just allowed to have anything? Or like Canada and the States, not allowed to have a wild animal as a pet? 90 answers so far. So a lot of you got true. So the answer is true. It is illegal to have pets. A lot of you got this incorrect. So illegal to have wild animals as pets in Costa Rica. Leading to our second thing, excited snail takes our lead. If you are any of these people, you can let us know who you are in the chat as well. Animals that spread seeds across the rainforest are called seed planters, seed dispersers, seed eaters, or seed crushers. Sort of like our macaw beak that we learned about a second ago. I don't know. Dun, dun, dun. Ooh, we're out there a little more tentative with this one, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> 70 answers in so far. Nice job, guys. Seed dispersers is our correct answer as we lead into our final question. And then we're heading for a Q&A. Sighted snail is a good lead over mountain horse. What's the largest species of owl? Oh, we're throwing in owls. Back to golden barn owl, pygmy owl, or screech owl. I will say pygmy owl unlikely to be our biggest because of the name. Now, I really do encourage you all to check out our YouTube channel for the owl program. One of my favorite programs we've ever done with the Toucan Rescue Ranch was their owl session. Super, super cool stuff. So do check that one done. Dead even for all of them. Spectacled Owls, our winner. Throwing you guys off today with our coot. Having some fun. Um, third place, Excited Snail. Miss Williams, I'm coming to you first. Stony Plain Central next. Everyone is going to get a round of questions, I promise. And so stick around. Fast Orcs and our winner in our coot is Epic Bat, which, as we found out, toucans occasionally eat, which is terrifying. Um, Miss Williams class, if you guys want to unmute your mic grade sixes, I'll head to you guys for our first question. Welcome to the broadcast in the uh, audio spot, guys. Hi. Thank you. Um, two of our biggest questions are, um, what are the lifespans of some of these birds? And are the toucans endangered as well, or just some of the macaws? Great question. Great question. So first off, the lifespan one, one of my favorite questions. With macaws, that's a fascinating fact. When uh, they have decent care, uh, macaws can live up to 80, 90 years. And we have world records of macaws living more than 100 years. So an animal like a macaw can live a very, very long time. Now, if we're talking about a bird like a toucan, then the lifespan is a lot shorter. It is rare for a uh, macaw to go past, uh, sorry, for a toucan to go past uh, 25. Some of the longest living toucans I've heard of have lived 30 years, but it's, it's very uh, weird for a macaw to live, uh, for a toucan to live such a long lifespan. Now, something very interesting is that in the wild, they're going to live uh, far less. Uh, for a macaw, a very good lifespan would be 20 years. 
And in the case of a toucan living 12 years, it would be a good lifespan. Now, your second question was about, uh, I'm sorry, could you remind me what the question yeah. was? Are they endangered as well? We oh. talked about endangered macaws, how about toucans? Great, great question. Now, the species that we have in Costa Rica are not declared in danger of extinction. They don't have that very special or maximum um, kind of protection. Um, however, some species of toucans outside of Costa Rica are in danger of extinction. And some uh, have been cut categorized in different ways. So if you check out the UCN red list, you'll see that there is a whole array of different categories. And uh, some of the toucans uh, that we have here are classified as vulnerable. Fantastic. Thanks, Steph. Uh, folks, we're going to try and keep it to one question per group. I'll try and take a second round. we get about 10 minutes together before I know some of you have to go. So Stony Plain Central, the Clemens class, are coming to you next. Greystone, stay tuned right after that. Hey, please. Welcome in. Hi, guys. Okay, so do you have a question? What's your question? How do parrots talk? How do they talk, Steph? <laughs> oh, I love that question, guys. So let me tell you something very interesting about parrots and macaws. So I was telling you that parrots and macaws have a tongue that looks more like the human tongue. That allows for them to make some noises that are a little bit more similar to the noises that we make. But there's something else that allows for them to make or imitate the sound, the words that we, that we say. Now, something very important to mention is that they're not really talking, they're just imitating the sounds that we make. Meaning that they can actually, some species of parrots have great memory and great intelligence. That's allow, that allows for them to remember even songs in some species like the yellow parrot. Great, parrot. Uh, great green macaws and scarlet macaws uh, imitate just like random words. They cannot really remember like sentences. But the other thing that they have is that underneath the bill, they have this little hole that allows for the air to come in. And this allows for to, uh, macaws to be able to whistle and make a lot of very interesting noises. Cool, thank you so much for that, Steph. I want to encourage our classes, when you're done this broadcast, look up BBC Lyrebird for the most amazing mimicry you're ever gonna hear in the world ever. It's like the coolest video ever in natural history of all time. I'll try and link it to you when we're done this program. I will note too, for anyone who has more questions after we're done, ToucanRescueRanch.org is definitely an amazing team there. We'll answer your questions. There's so much to discover that we can't even fit it into one broadcast level, which is a good problem to have. Uh, Greystone <laughs> Elementary, I'm coming to you next, and then Miss James after that. Hi, Greystone. Oh, there was I. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> We've got two questions for you. Go ahead, girl. Are baby toucans nicer than adult toucans? Yeah. And? What was your question? What is the average temperature in Costa Rica? Ooh, the temperature of Costa Rica, Steph, and babies better than adults. <laughs> so, by if by better you mean cuter? <laughs> or friendlier, like maybe not so aggressive, I guess. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, when, when toucans are babies, they are a lot less aggressive because they depend on their mother. And if they don't have their mother around, uh, they're going to go ahead and be friendly just because they want food. <laughs> uh, now, the other question, what is the average temperature? Well, it depends where you go. Costa Rica uh, has a great biodiversity, uh, like Jesse explained. And it's because we have a very interesting geography, a very, uh, a very wide variety of habitats. And here where we are in the Central Valley, the average temperature, and guys, I only know this in Celsius. I'm sorry about that, but it's around 24 degrees uh, Celsius. Yeah. So for our American friends, about 80, somewhere in there, 75 to 80, uh, about that. Uh, and it does get warmer in parts of Costa Rica, but in Alabama, it gets warmer than that, too, certainly. So I'm glad we got that question. They're really keen to find out about countries. They've got a really cool unit right now. So thank you for that, Steph. Um, Miss James, we're going to head up. Uh, do you guys come on in, unmute your mic, and you're good to go. Hey, fifth graders. How long does it usually take to rewild a toucan? To, oh, rewild a what? We missed that with the toucan bark. <laughs> rewild a toucan? Yes. Oh, if you want to send it back to the wild, Steph, how long does it take? 
Well, it really depends on the situation because it's completely different if you have a baby than if you have an adult toucan that maybe was injured. Uh, and some, of course, cannot return into the wild. By the way, for example, this macaw that you're seeing, I don't know if anyone noticed, but sadly, he is, uh, she is missing one of her uh, wings. Of course, in a case like that, and it may happen to a toucan, there's no possible rewilding. If maybe it's just a fracture that needs to heal, well, it might take uh, from four to six months, depending on the severity of the injury. Sometimes it's a matter of allowing for uh, the, you know, the wings to heal and then they can be immediately rewilded. But if we're talking about a baby toucan, sometimes we've had hatchlings. Hatchlings are baby birds that just came out of the egg. That can take actually around a year for them to be, uh, you know, well enough. And we have a period of training for them to be able to find food. So that can take a very long time. I'm really, really glad we got that question. Thanks, Napa. Uh, we're going to head to Johnson City, Tennessee. Southside fifth graders, come on in and take us away. <laughs> how many species of toucan are in America? Ooh, how many, Steph? In the American continent or in America, the U.S.? Ooh, uh, actually, are there any in the United States, Steph? No, nope, there are no. none. Okay, so then in the Americas total, you know? So in the Americas, it's 32. If you Google it, you will find different numbers. Why? Because there have been species that before they were considered two separate species. One of the examples is uh, the yellow-throated toucan. Before we thought it was Swayson's toucan and it was categorized as a separate species. But they now have realized that many of the toucans that they th thought were different species were actually the same. So a good number <laughs> uh, would be around 32 species of toucans in the American continent. Very cool. And good for you knowing that offhand. That's a very tricky question. So <laughs> Uh, we're going to do our multi-age group, Fremont Elementary in Illinois. Welcome in, one, two, three. Come on in. Come on. Come on. All right, stop, stop. All right, Mason, go ahead. What can we do in Illinois to help the rainforest? What can we do in Illinois to help the rainforest? I love it. Thank you so much for that great question, guys. Steph. Yes, absolutely. I love that question, too. Oops, sorry. I love that question, too, guys. I'm just going to... Uh, change the view of my camera once again so I can see you guys before we say bye. That's a great question and I love it because a lot of people think that there's not much that you can do back home to help a place like the forest. But let me tell you, there is. I'm going to give you an example with the great green macaw I told you. So there are different things that people in the world do that impact the rainforest. For example, what we eat matters. So if you have the choice to maybe buy uh, food that is organic, what is organic? It means that it's food that didn't use pesticides. Uh, that means that they, that food was probably um, cultivated using very eco-friendly methods that has a huge impact on wildlife. Because I was, as I was explaining before, in the case of banana plantations and pineapple plantations are often in the Caribbean, when it's a monoculture, meaning that there's just one species of pineapple and it's hectares and hectares of just that species, you need to use a lot of pesticides and of course you need to cut down the trees. So the choices that you make, also if in your family you're gonna buy, I don't know, something made out of wood, buying certified wood that it is of a ethical origin can have a huge impact. As I mentioned, many of these birds are suffering because we cut down the trees, animals like toucans. So guys, if we make sure that the things that we consume every day are of an ethical origin, that can have a big impact in the rainforest and the wildlife in it. This is something that we hear about in all our conservation programs. Take care of what you buy and don't waste what you buy. Don't waste the general, whether it's emissions, whether it's plastics, whether it's food. All those things go a really long way to helping wildlife both in Costa Rica and around planet Earth. So I really like that message. Thank you. Um, time flies and you're having fun. We're nearing the end of the broadcast. I do want to note toucanrescueranch.org on social media platforms as well. So much more to discover and check them out on our YouTube channel as well. Miss Lies class, well, thanks for your patience, grade threes, and come on in to wrap us up with one final question. Hey. What do toucans eat? 
What was that? Could you repeat that for us? How many toucans in the world? Oh, how many toucans in the world, Steph? And what do they eat? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so toucans, as you saw in the quiz, you saw that little term, are seed dispersers because they eat fruit. They swallow the seeds. It's different as in the macaws that crush it and don't disperse it. Uh, and then they poop them all over the forest. So they eat fruit, but they also need meat. So they're omnivores. This means that they're going to go ahead and get it's. And let me clarify, this is just a supplement to their diet. Most of what they eat is fruit. They are frugivores, but they need that meat in order to survive. So as I was saying before, a chicken that doesn't get that source of protein is going to get sick and can even die. Now you ask how many species of toucans there are in the world. Now here's an interesting fact, guys. You can only find their own fasted family, the true toucans in the American continent. So the answer is actually uh, the 32 species that I told you that you can find in the American continent. And then uh, just in case this was the, the thought behind the question, before we bring in all our classes for a big thank you for all, how many individual toucans, Steph? Do we have any idea? Are there millions? No. Are there thousands? Okay, we don't know. No idea. <laughs> One, two, three, you're looking around. Let's see. <laughs> Uh, this is the thing about the tropics in general is that it's really hard to get a sense of how many individual animals there are because there's still so much to discover. There's so many places that are untrammeled. Every time we look in tropical regions, especially in Central and South America, we find new species. So it's a really exciting place to do research, to explore, and so much more. Classes, thank you so much for your incredible questions today and your enthusiasm. ToucanRescueRanch.org. I'll be sending an email to all of you in a minute with that, the liar bird, and so much more. And Steph, as you well know, what we do to wrap up every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our classes, Alabama, California, Ontario, Alberta, beyond. Thank you all so much for being here today, uh, and welcome into the broadcast. Thank you so much. You can join me in saying thank you and farewell. Have a wonderful day.